Today, we're very excited to have with us Mie Kongo. Mie grew up in the outskirts of Tokyo and now lives and works in Evanston, Illinois, where she makes uh, multidisciplinary work, including ceramic sculptures, installations, 2D work, and porcelain design objects. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including recent exhibitions at, at the Arts and Literature Laboratory in Madison, Fourth Ward Project Space in Chicago, Gromlund Gallery of Art at Indiana University in Bloomington, and the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago. Her most recent solo exhibition was titled Without Within, an exhibition with sound installation by Norman Long in Audible Gallery at Experimental Studio, Sound Studio. Mia has done artist residencies in Japan, the Netherlands, and Germany. She received her BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and MFA in Ceramics from Cranbrook Academy of Art. She is a faculty member at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Mie Kongo. So, um, my name is Mie Kongo. I'm originally from Japan. I was born and raised in the outskirts of Tokyo. I first moved here um, to Chicago in 1992. I'm currently a faculty member, adjunct associate professor of ceramics department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I've been teaching interdisciplinary classes such as ceramics for design object, ceramics and architecture. In those classes, I work with the design focused students from AIADO department, which means architecture, interior architecture, designed object. And I teach glaze theory class and another class called Color of Ceramics, which focuses on surface treatment of clay and ceramics. I've been teaching at SAIC since 2008, and I very much enjoy working and interacting with students. I like to briefly talk about my background training I have a traditional pottery making background. Long time ago, I've assisted um, a few production pottery workshops in Japan. And after that, until I went to graduate school in 2006, I was working as a produ production potter in Evanston, Illinois. My husband, Charles Young had been running a production pottery business for more than a decade, and I joined, I joined him to run the business together. So for, year, for four years, I'm, I'm sorry, for many years, I was producing porcelain tablewares from morning to night every day. Um, our total volume of production used to range from um, 2,000 to 3,000 pieces a year. So this is um, one of our service platters that we used to produce. We used industrial machines in order to mass produce our tablewares. This one we used to call cereal bowl. We first formed the porcelain clay in the mold on a machine called the jigger. And the next day, each piece was slightly dried and trimmed by hand on the wheel. Then I used a brush to cover the surface with slip which is a liquid clay with blue pigment. Then when the piece is semi-dry, we chattered, which means that creating the textured spiral pattern on the surface. Then we glazed and fired everything in our gas kiln to 2300 Fahrenheit. Um, these porcelain wares are very durable. So our aim was to mass produce porcelain product that are very close to handmade with an aid of machines. So this is a jigger machine, and that's me working. Um, so I just put a plaster mold, which has the exterior design of the salad plate, which I'm making, and I'm pressing down the porcelain clay into the foot ring, making sure that foot ring will be completely filled with the clay all the way to the to the bottom. And as soon as I bring down the arm, the machine starts to spin. And the blade has 
the interior design of the plate. And as it's compressing down the clay, the excess clay is getting squeezed out. So when I jiggered, I jiggered all day. And when I trimmed, I trimmed all day. That's the end. That's the process of jiggering. So I mentioned that um, we give um, textured spiral uh, uh, pattern on the surface, and it's called a chattering. The chattering is a decorative, decorating technique that was developed 100 years ago in Korea and Japan. Um, the video shows how the surface is chattered. Um, I'll start in a minute, um, in a second. Uh, we use the thin metal tool that has a blade-like sharp end on the one side of the tool. And it, it was bent slightly like a hook like that. And when the tool with the blade side hits the surface of the clay, it jumps or vibrates and nicks off the layer of blue clay and it reveal the white clay underneath. Um, it just takes ten, five seconds to do it. So this is called chattering. So um, I actually enjoyed all the processes of making the production pottery, but in 2006, I was accepted to go to Cranbrook Academy of Art for the graduate program, and then we decided to shut down the business completely. Um, although I said that I love all the processes, it was a physically demanding job. And we both were suffering from chronic back pain and sciatica. And it was saddening to close the business. But I truly appreciate those years of experiences as production potter because I had learned enormously about the material clay and how to handle clay and also about firings. In summer of 2011, I went to EKWC, European Ceramic Work Center in Holland and spend three months there as an artist in resident. During my residency, I was introduced to CAT CAM program, computer-aided design, and computer-aided manufacturing. I was fascinated by everything I saw in a digital lab, such as designing and 3D modeling software called Rhino, CNC milling machine, 3D printers, and so forth. And I was interested in learning everything. I finished the residency and came back to Chicago and took a Rhino class and CNC class at SAIC. Then I spent next few years just focusing on making small designed object, utilizing the new skill set that I had learned. So the first project I did with the digital technology was duct base. I observed this air duct in the studio at EKWC for three months, and I was particularly interested in the transitional part. So the square duct becomes circular, having that transitional part in between. I wanted to design a base that is mimicking that air duct shape. So I drew this shape in Rhino and printed out the prototype with 3D printer in plastic and made a mold off of the plastic model and the slip cast with pigmented porcelain. Uh, the final product is about 9.5 inches tall and it has no glaze. Um, that bases comes in five different colors. Next project. I was invited to an exhibition called Chocolate Soiree at Bridgeport Art Center and it was a collaborative exhibition with ceramic artist and chocolatier. 
the participants were asked to create a container which serves her chocolate truffles. And it was when I adapted my dog, Moko, and she loved the dog toy called Kong. And Kong, the blue toy, is a rubber toy that has hollow shape inside. And so dog owners stuff treats like peanut butter or other treat in the toy. And um, it's supposed to keep dogs busy and preoccupied. So I thought, oh, why don't I make a Kong for humans? So that a container for treat, uh, truffles, and the one on the right, the yellow one, is my version of Kong for humans. The black piece on the left is the 3D printed plastic prototype, and the blue one on the right is a slip cast porcelain. It's the final product. So um, I showed you how um, my porcelain shrinks 16%. You can see how big the 16% shrinkage is. And the top part is a lid, and there's an interior space for the treat to be served. So I made uh, the box also in five different colors. I'd like to talk about just one more digital project. Um, this project is similar to the duct face. Uh, there are many useful tools in Rhino, but one of uh, many, one of my favorite tools is called Loft. You can draw curves and connect them and using Loft tool to gener by generating the wall. So to quickly explain, the very bottom curve is a square, four, has four facets. Then the one above is doubled, has eight facets, an octagon. And then above that, it has 16 facets. And above that, it has 32 facets. And above that, it has 64 facets. And then because I sanded a top and it has um, no facets, which is supposed to be a circle. This shape uh, starts as square at the bottom and it makes its way up to become a circle at the top. So after I uh, drew these five curves and then just highlight all the curves and just hit loft, and this is what happens. The loft tool uh, generate the walls to connect all the horizontal profiles. And um, you can choose a curved wall or straight edge wall. So they look very different, but they shared identical horizontal profile shapes. Yeah, so I think work like this, which, dis which is designed with mathematical progression and requires mathematical accuracy, can be best achieved with digital technology. So I sent in my digital file to AOC at Advanced Output Center at SAAC, and I have them printed out in plastic. So this is about 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch. It's made with plastic. And then I made mold off of this and slip cast with porcelain. And these are the final product with porcelain. Uh, these pieces were shown at the exhibition called Reformat Digital Fabrication in Clay with three other ceramic artists who also worked with digital technology. So I enjoyed working on these projects and spent two to three years just honing the skills with the digital technology and also mold making and slip casting. But then I started missing making sculptures but more like I missed action of building or sculpting with multiple components. And now I'm going to start talking about my current body of work. But to explain my work, it is best that I talk about how I came to make the current body of work and what the influences are and the references that I'm making through my work. Um, so after having produced a portion of object, objects with digital technology intensively for a few years, as I already mentioned, I wanted to build rather than just creating a single object. So I took the desire literally and decided to make porcelain building blocks and try to build structures. 
It was also at the same time when architecture department faculty member Mary English and I joined and submitted a new course proposal, Ceramics and Architecture. And we won a team teaching award to teach the class together the next year. The concept of the class is to reinvent traditional bricks and tiles, and most importantly, to incorporate advanced digital technology into ceramics processes. And I was preparing to teach the course and conducting a lot of research and looking at many historic and modern brick, brick buildings. And those really inspired me. One day, I stumbled upon a magazine article on Sana. Sana is a multiple award-winning Japanese architect duo, Kazuo Sejima and Ryuei Nishizawa. Most notably, Sana was awarded prestigious award Pritzker Prize in 2010. The article was about the brand new building of New Museum in New York City, which they designed in 2007. In the article, there was an image of their very early architectural model of the new museum. It was a quick made model with white copy paper with scotch taped corners. It was really rough and clunky and not refined at all. The image on the right is not the one that I saw in the magazine. This model seems a lot more refined ones, but when I saw those clunky and chunky models, it delighted me that the fact that something so magnificent and sublime started with such a clunky model. Then I started researching ideation stage of architectural models, and I learned that those models are called concept models. So I'm interested in concept models. What I'm really interested in is their potentiality. It can be something and anything, and of course, I want to continue exploring the possibilities with digital technology. At some point, I asked myself, why do I like technology? First answer that comes to my mind is its speed. I ideate and visualize it virtually in Rhino, and send the information to the outputting machine, and to see the physical model, physical object the next day. Depending on the form and size, it might take hours to print or CNC, but it is still a rapid prototyping, and the speed is what attracts me. This is a photo of my components just got CNC'd in a high-density rendering foam called Ren Foam. It's a foam, but extremely dense and firm and strong. These are my 3D printed plastic components, very hard and quite durable. Now, SAIC Ceramics Department owns two 3D clay printers. This is about two years ago when I was printing my design with brown stoneware. And here's the video of um, how this machine works. So the tray, the black, uh, it's actually a, a bat, but the tray moves along X and Y axis, and the clay cylinder moves up and down along Z axis, and that's how walls are built. The printed clay was fired to certain temperature, and it looks very orangey now, and assembled with my porcelain blocks and other components in this work. My mentor, Tony Hepburn from Crownbrook, who passed away in 2015, once said this in his Crownbrook Ceramics Departmental Philosophy. At Crownbrook, we interject the ancient ceramic. We also interject new technology. 
like wireless firing of kilns and a connected laptop in every ceramic studio. Now we see a 20,000 year tradition of clay working aligned with the history of theoretical thought linked to immediate transformational access to our world. The hybridizing of this potential is what ignites the program. And I could say that hybridizing of this potential is what ignites my practice. So the pink pieces in the middle, they're rain foam, CNC to rain, rain foam, and uh, painted with acrylic paint. And one of the uh, 3D printed plastic component was used in, the, um, in this work, along with porcelain, uh, yellow wool felt, and uh, sheet metal, painted sheet metal, and the wood. Um, this one, um, the yellow piece is CNC rain foam, uh, painted with acrylic, assembled along with porcelain, wood, uh, wool felt, and uh, metal sheet, and glazes and underglazes. Um, when I was growing up, my two older sisters and I had to go to calligraphy lesson every week. Calligraphy is one of the educational lessons that Japanese parents commonly send their kids to after school. I started at a very young age, like five years old. I loved it and I enjoyed it very much. Before we begin writing letters with brush, we fold the paper into two or four and use the grid as a guide. We're supposed to locate each letter in the grid in balance and there are rules to follow for kids. We usually practice over and over until the teacher finally approves it. That's how we learned. It is true that calligraphy shaped the way I see and think of forms. This is where I first learned notions of space, form, proportion, balance, lines, volume, compositions, and so on. What I have learned during those years in calligraphy lessons are deeply rooted in the foundation of my aesthetics. Japanese kanji and Chinese characters were same thing. Chinese characters were imported to Japan from China in 5th century, and Japan began to adapt Chinese characters by meaning into our language. Kanji was what I used to draw in calligraphy along with Japanese alphabet. Kanjis are derived from what things look like. It is pictorial, as you can see. There are many singular units like these, but most of kanjis comprise a combination of multiple components. For example, the character on the left is a singular kanji tree, but when there are three trees put together, it creates new meaning, forest. Here, uh, these are more examples of how Multiple components are combined together and create new meanings. So when a person and a tree are combined, it means to rest. When the sun and the moon are combined, it means bright. More than 20 years ago, I took an art history, uh, art history course called Concept of Art at School of the Art Institute of Chicago. The faculty Erin Hogan introduced as an intellectual movement in the mid 20th century called structuralism. The idea of structuralism can be found in linguistics, anthropology, philosophy, art, and architecture. Structuralism is a theoretical methodology emphasizing the elements of culture must be understood in terms of their relationship to a larger overarching system or structure. Everything and everyone exists in the intertwined web of network and their underlying structures and laws to explain everything. Therefore, we can be understood 
only through our interrelations. And this is how the teacher, Arian, explained the concept exactly, and it made a lasting impression on me. She said that um, there's no one who you are. Who you are is all the relationships that you have with other people. This idea stuck with me for more than 20 years. So I'm interested in creating and discovering interesting relationships of components within my work and between my works. When making my work in my studio, I think about formal relationships, color relationships, material relationships, conceptual relationships, and so on. What I'm trying to do is to rearrange and re-edit things to see and understand them in a new way. I'd like to show you uh, four more images of my work from recent exhibitions. This piece has a uh, the wall felt and two panels in the front. The square is made with the copper. The pink rectangle is acrylic. And white blocks are all porcelain. Uh, it was shown at the uh, Searville uh, Art Gallery at the Tr Trinity Christian College. The brown band is uh, birch veneer and uh, white blocks are porcelain, and one of them is glazed. The green quarter circle arch is uh, wood, painted wood. This piece is about, it was as tall as me, or maybe it was a little bit taller, made with uh, porcelain blocks and wood, brass sheet metal, brass rod, and uh, the pink block on the floor is the CNC, cut uh, red foam, paint it. Okay, um, yeah, uh, so the green band is also uh, veneer and I paint it and the white blocks are porcelain and has a, and there's also a, a, one of the 3D printed plastic component is stacked on top of porcelain blocks. And this is the uh, last piece. Um, this was shown at the uh, exhibition called Without Within at Experimental Sound Studio this summer. The white big piece is a hand-built stoneware and glazed and fired. Frame is with, made with wood, a couple porcelain blocks and copper sheet and 3D printed plastic object on the very top. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> hmm. um, reclaimed wood is usually, I think of them as a found object or found by chance. So it's an element of um, found and chance rather than uh, fabricated and planned or designed. Are you asking like, would I recycle or upcycle? Um, no, when, when the piece is done, it's done, yeah. <laughs> the duct, air duct. Again, like I was there for three months and I looked at it for three months and I I was thinking someday I'm gonna make a work about this duct, and it, that's just happened. For the con piece, um, again, you know, I had this assignment that I have to design a container for chocolate truffle, and I was just thinking, but then when I saw that toy on the floor, oh, that's a, that's a container for treat, and um, that's just how I thought. So, um, <laughs> I went to Home Depot and um, I was looking for paint to cover this quarter um, circle wood piece, the green piece. And you know how there are hundreds of paint colors and, and then they have very obscure names. And this green paint had very obscure name, End of the Rainbow. And 
I was just wondering, what does that mean, like end of the rainbow? And I, of course, I came home and I Googled end of the rainbow. And I discovered a lot of things about rainbow that I did not know. And I just realized how, what I thought the rainbow was totally misconception and totally that uh, I was kind of like I believed without any evidence or anything. Just like that's that I think many of you think that rainbow um, is a arch, but it's actually rainbow is a circle, and um, you have to be a certain angle, certain direction from the uh, the rainbow to see the rainbow. If you move uh, or trying to get to the end of the rainbow, rainbow disappears. So I just, you know, that kind of discovery was really, um, I, I, I enjoyed this discovery and I just thought like, oh, what I believe is probably, there's so many things that I believe that are wrong. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's that's how I decided to uh, name gave the title of um, end of the rainbow to the show. I use my intuition <laughs> to choose materials, but uh, what I think about is uh, natural versus uh, artificial material. Uh, um, or like a found object or designed object, fabricated uh, object, or um, yeah, but materials, sometimes I have a specific uh, reason why I use this and that, but sometimes, uh, I mean, most of the times I work with my intuition. I don't sketch, I, again, I, play really hard in my studio, like kids playing with the, like building blocks and stuff. And I don't have preconceived idea at all, but I just collect components and then I just build in my studio. But usually there's one object I'm really focusing on. So for this piece, someone gave me um, a long piece of veneer and I really wanted to make a work with this veneer. Yeah, so veneer inspired me to make this piece or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>